أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشدا ومن يحسهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى فإن الجنة هي المأوى رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وهل الأقدة من لساني يبكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتناب آمين يا رب الله سبحانه وتعالى سيز عند القرآن وأما من خاف مقام ربه وأما as for the one خاف مقام ربه who fears that time where he will stand before Allah the maqam of Allah meaning when he is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى and he stopped his nafs from its desires if you stopped your nafs from your desires وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى then Jannah is this person's station where he will end up okay so the condition that a person has to be in Jannah, meaning Jannah means what? Jannah means the happiness of Allah. You earned the happiness of Allah, so Allah gave you Jannah as a reward. So if you get the happiness of Allah, how will that happen? When you have uh, put a stop, put a break. Naha means to literally like to put a break on something. And you stop your nafs from having hawa, from having desires. Now, there are different levels of this, uh, which is what I want to talk about today. Um, one is, for example, Allah says, don't do something. وَلَا uh, You know, don't go near this tree. وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ Allah Himself says, don't go near this tree. And you wanted to go near the tree, but you stop yourself. This is one level. Of stopping yourself from uh, listening to your nafs. Your nafs wants something else. And uh, Allah wants something else, and you're able to put the brakes on yourself, and you're able to force yourself not to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. This is one level. As for the one who fears standing before Allah, and this is really the emphasis of the Quran is on the Day of Judgment. Meaning, in a sense, there is more emphasis, and I've said this before, in the Quran on the emphasis on the stand, the fear, the internal fear that I have to stand before Allah, or the internal fear that I will have to answer for my actions. That fear is probably more put into Quran than even the lessons of Tawheed, the Risala, and so on and so forth. Anyway, <coughs> But it's not just limited to, very important, that if Allah said don't do something and you keep yourself from doing that. It's not just limited to that. One day Umar عنه, he was in the marketplace and he saw a person purchasing meat. So he purchased meat. Now the second day Umar was in the marketplace again. And the person was buying meat the second day. And he was in the marketplace the third day buying meat again. So this time Omar asked me, he said, every day I'm here, you're always buying meat. Why? What's the reason? He said, I, I, I want to, I like it. I like to eat the meat. So Omar said, every time you want something, that means you have to act upon it. Meaning, meat is halal or haram? It's halal. But Umar was upset that this person is not able, every time he wants something, his nafs wants something, he has to necessarily get it. You don't have that much control. So Umar got up, and he got scared. He threw the meat and ran. Right? And by the way, about Umar radiallahu anh, I know everyone feels that Umar was very strict, and everyone would run. But do you know what's interesting about Umar? His house, his daughters never knew that that's what people think about Umar. Omar's daughters never knew that he was a lion outside the house. The daughter of Omar says that we always thought, when she found out, oh, this is what you think of my dad, that, you know, he's very strict and very, like, strong and very, like, 
أَشَدُّ فِي أَمْرِ اللَّهِ عُمَرَ The Prophet said this about Umar. The most severe event uh, regarding the commandments of Allah, the most severe regarding the commandments of Allah is Umar. The Prophet said this about Umar. So outside in the world where the commandments are being implemented, he was a little tough. But Umar's uh, daughter says, he, we thought he's a sheep inside the house. We would think Umar is just, you can just walk over him. <coughs> right? The daughters would say, we want this dad, and he would start doing it. Like he would just, so Umar had one personality outside the house, but he had a totally different personality inside the house. He was like a sheep. So th this concept uh, that Umar was always strict and had Jalal, like even probably like Musa is not 100%, he had, a, he had a very nice and a very soft personality inside the house, but he was relatively more strict outside the house. Anyway, having said that, Umar saw this guy buying the meat, right? And the guy, and he asked the, the per he saw the first day, the second day, the third day, the third day when Umar started asking him, why are you buying this meat for three days in a row? And he said, I, I like, I, I want to, I like meat. And Umar said, and as he was getting up, you know, to, to take care of the guy, uh, the guy threw the meat and ran. And so what is my point? My point is that just because something is halal, doesn't mean you have to act upon it. Just because something is halal doesn't mean you have to act upon it all the time. And so some of the scholars, you know, they have talked about وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ As for the one who fears Allah. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْحَوَى He puts a stop to his desires. He puts a stop to his desires, not only when Allah says don't do this, but also in regular life. He tries to put a balance to himself, not to overindulge in something, and therefore put a balance to his life by stopping his nafs from doing and getting out of control. So what are the three, I want to talk about this in different levels, but uh, the first one I want to talk about are three things. <clears throat> how much you control your tongue, how much you control your food, and the third one I'll talk about in a second. One of the ways, one, that the way to control your nafs, put a stop to your nafs, is that it is not necessary to speak every time you feel like speaking. In fact, you know that desire where you're really hungry, and you're hungry, and you want some food, and you feel like, I need to eat something? The scholars of Islam, they say the desire to speak more is the same as the desire to eat more. The desire to speak more is the same as the desire to eat more. And so you have to ask yourself, do I really need to say something that I'm about to say? And if you cannot stop yourself from saying something, right, talk beyond a certain amount, if you're not able to keep your words succinct and your idea... Now, this is not necessarily with your wife, right, and people that you're building relationships with. But in general, in, in society, in general, you have to ask yourself, do I talk too much? Do I talk too much? Do I keep on going? And, or, or if someone says something, do I necessarily have to respond with something? I'm sure you've all seen people that if you start a topic with them, they just can't stop. They have to go on and on and on and on, and they just can't stop. Because they don't have, they can't put a stop to their nafs, they can't put a stop to their desires. It's very, very important that you ask yourselves, and you even look at your children. You know, look at the children also, that when you talk to them, do they, when they talk to each other, even the young generation should know this, that, that in Islam we don't want to use the tongue too much, more than necessary, right? And talking too much is a sign, is a sign that you can't put, or you have a trouble putting your nafs into a stop. Right? And, and, and the general rule I say is that if you're talking, try not to talk more than three minutes at a time. Unless, of course, you're giving a khutbah or a hanata or something, right? Right? The, so, generally, talk three minutes, four minutes, then that's enough. You've talked enough. Right? The second thing is food. And this is the problem, you know, America is an obese country. We got the epidemic of being obese. And there are many reasons for that. But do we eat too much, right? The, the, the tabi'in, meaning the people who knew the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu the people who knew the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they used to say 
that the food of the prophets, the food of the prophets was to eat once a day. This was the food of the prophets. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, she says, that if the prophet was to eat more, if the prophet was eat to eat more, if he was to eat more than once a day, right? He would probably eat once a day and then some dates as a snack. That would be like the maximum the prophet would eat. Right? But we live in a time that every time we... And this is how we've trained ourselves. And this is the problem of the fast food society. That every time you feel like doing anything, you just do it. You feel like eating, you eat. You don't even ask yourself, am I really hungry? Am I really, really hungry? And then, on top of that, uh, there are other reasons why we get more hungry. Which I'm not going to go into. Like, for example, uh, I've been looking into this. It's very, very interesting. Is that, <coughs> you know, wheat and, and, and these breads that we have... You know, the seed of the bread has three parts. There is the chaff that's on top, and then there's the germ that's in the bottom. The germ is the actual seed. In the middle, you know how you have an egg, you have the yolk, which is yellow, and then you have the white. The white is the food, the nutrient for the chicken, right? So it's fat, basically. The white is the, the part that's food for the chicken. And the same thing with the seed. There's this thing called endosperm, which is the food for the seed. What they do is because they have to keep these weeds for a very prolonged time, for six months, seven months, then it has to travel thousands of miles to reach its de destination. They remove the germ, which is like using removing the oak, the, the, the center, right? And then they remove the top part, which is the chaff, where a lot of the nutrients are there. And all that's left is the endosperm, where there's fat. That's just pure fat and very little nutrients. And so that's what we're eating when we're eating wheat bread, and white bread, and all of these things. And so, all it is is fat. And so, you know, I, I just learned about this actually recently, but all we're eating is, is, is 99, when we're eating wheat and bread, we're only eating basically fats and very, very little nutrients. Because the whole process of, uh, the whole process removes the, the nutrients because they, they, don't want pests, they don't want pests on it, they don't want insects on it, and so, anyway. That's not the point. The point is that we, the second thing we have to, the first thing is to stop ourselves from talking too much. The second thing is stopping ourselves from eating too much. And so the, the Tabi'in, they said that the food of the prophets was to eat once a day. Was to eat once a day. And in fact, you'll find this very interesting, uh, two, two points I'd like to raise. Number one, a average Muslim, an average is salihin, um, the, 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 the tabi'in, they say, the food of the pious person was to eat twice a day. The food of the pious person was to eat twice a day. And then they were asked about eating thre three times a day, and they said, then you become like an animal. You become like an animal if you eat three times a day. So this is how our predecessors, they used to think, now I know there are a lot of other theories nowadays, you should eat many, many times, little by little, every day. I'm not going to go into all of that, but this is how our predecessors looked at the issue. Some Muslims need to do proper research on this issue also, but uh, the idea is not to give in to your nafs all the time. As for the one who fears Allah, and he can put a stop to his desires. Then Jannah is going to be his place to go. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all amongst those people who can stop our desires, right, from overindulging and just every time giving in to our nafs. Our, we feel like talking, we start talking. We feel like joking, we're just joking. And then we use our tongues in other ways that are even worse when we're slandering other people or even if we're sitting in a place where other people are being slandered. It's the same. It's no different. The Prophet tell, in the Quran tells us, remove yourself from that situation where other people are being sent. Why are you going to give your good deeds to somebody else for free? Right? And in another hadith, the Prophet said, Ghiba, talking behind people's back, is, and Ghiba is if it's true. Bukhtan is if it's not true. Ghiba is when you talk behind a person's back and it's true. Right? You know, one day, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, Aisha radiallahu anha, she, um, she was making fun of one of the wives of the Prophet, uh, Safiha, her name was Safiha. She was short. So she said, you know that wife of yours, and she just made a gesture to make the point she's very short. She didn't even say anything. 
And the Prophet says, Wallahi, Wallahi, if you take what you just did and throw it into the oceans, it would become poison. <coughs> it would become poison. So this is just one wife talking about another wife. What's the big deal? Right? It's not, I mean, from a family perspective, what, it's, it's just family members talking about each other. But the Prophet didn't even like that. He told Aisha, if you take what you just did and throw it into the ocean, it would become poison. So, and this was in a case where it was true. This is Liba. Liba is in a case where it's true. Bohtan is where it's not even true. Bohtan is where it's not... Very lucky are people who people backbite. Because they're getting rewards for free. Very lucky are people, people, other people are backbiting about them or saying negative things about them. They're actually very lucky because in the Akhirah, they're going to be very lucky. They're going to be very fortunate. They're going to be very happy. They're going to be like, okay, a lot of extra rewards for me. Right? So anyway, uh, so I was saying, the first thing to stop yourself from is to talk too much. And the second thing to stop yourself from is to uh, eat too much. And this is a big problem in the times that we live in. And it's not, and this, you know, talking about nafs, it's not important, it's not necessary. And the kids have to learn this, especially, especially, because I'm telling you this, that there is going coming a time, 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 15, I don't know. You know, the body is already in uh, the ICU, intensive care unit, and it's, it's living on machines, basically. The body can die any time. You know, the system is going to fall, and when the system falls, your kids will, learn how, will need to learn how to survive on basic foods. It's not always necessary that you t give your children food that's always tasting zesty and tasting good and tasting nice all the time. It's not necessary. They have to learn how to eat food that tastes just like normal food without, you know, making it look or taste better than it needs to be. A lot of times parents try very hard to make, ta make food every time the food tastes good. And that's fine, but if you do it every time, then they won't be able to survive in those tough times that are coming. If not for our generation, definitely for the next generation. Right, inshallah, I will uh, continue in my second khutbah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we praise Him, we praise Him, we praise Him, and 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 we فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى فإن الجنة هي المأوى. May Allah subhanahu wa taala help us to train ourselves to put a stop to our desires, to not talk too much, to not eat too much. You know, this is something, especially in the world that we live in, is hard to do, but it is it is necessary to train yourself to do this for yourself, for your children, and for the coming generation. I mean. This world is getting unhealthy day by day. And it's very, very important that we look at the, how we are eating and how our children are eating and look at the ingredients that we're eating because if we don't, then we're just headed in the wrong direction. We're giving the body. In fact, uh, I was talking about wheat and stuff. Do you know a lot of these grains that we eat today and cereal and stuff, these used to be foods for the animals. These used to be feed for the animals. They used to be feed for the animals that we now eat today as food, as humans. And we, we left the sunnah food, like barley, which is the real wheat the human beings used to eat. We, we've let, left those, we're eating animals of food, and because you know our diet is made mostly sugar, and then after that, the, uh, the wheat and stuff like that. And so, that, that's a big portion of our diet. And, and we're eating animals, we're feeding ourselves the, animal, the food that we used to give to our animals, now we're eating like as food as human beings. So these are things that we need to do research on and look into uh, and, and not just take for granted. Uh.
Allahu a'lam. Okay. The point I was trying to make was wa amma man khafa maqama rabbihi. As for the one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he do? Wa nahanna fsa'anil hawa. And he forbids, he puts a stop to his desires. He looks at himself. Some of the scholars say that every day train yourself that when your nafs says I want this, I want this. Stop yourself from wanting what you want even if it is halal. Just to train yourself that you have control over yourself. Right? There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that gives the example like this. The Prophet said ﷺ that the relationship between the awkama qala sallallahu the meaning of the hadith is, because I don't remember it right now, the exact words in the Arabic language, but the meaning of the hadith is awkama qala sallallahu that the relationship between the ruh and, and the ego and the, and, the, and the body is like the horse and the man on the horse. If the horse becomes too strong, meaning the horse wants to go in this direction or that direction. I don't know if you've ever been on a horse and you're trying to move it and it's not listening to you. you ever, I don't know if that's, but, uh, but I have, right? So the, the horse is like your ego. It either does what it wants or it doesn't do what you want. Even though you want something, but you can't control it. The man on top of the horse is not trained enough or is not strong enough, is too weak to control the horse. And your horse is like your body, is your nafs, is your desires. And the person on top is either too weak, the horse always throws it off, or he doesn't know how to control the horse. Or the opposite can also happen, where you have made your body so weak, which is also not the Islamic concept of piety. The Prophet ﷺ said, a stronger believer is more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. This is what the Prophet said. He a, 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 a mu'min qawiyu, a mu'min who is strong is better than a mu'min who is not strong. Right? And Umar did, used to dislike when people used to put themselves in a state where they have no strength and they're completely weak and they're completely just in a, in a, in a, in a horrible situation, physically speaking. Because if you're not strong physically, how can you be strong in your ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You're not going to feel like doing ibadah. You're going to need rest all the time too. So anyway, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ As for the one who fears Allah, وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ Let him, let him put a stop to his nafs. Now, some of the scholars of Islam, and this is more on the, uh, the traditional side like Imam Ghazali, and some of the scholars uh, that, that were uh, very influ influenced by Ghazali's, Imam Ghazali's thought and, and his ideas. And so they have even said to the point that, you know, uh, and, and I want to talk about this. Um, let me see how much time. I have like five minutes, so I don't really have that much time. But I want to talk about this very quickly. Uh, khalwa. Khalwa is the idea of being alone. Where you just have time alone between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does the Sharia say about this? I'm not going to go into this. But I will say that you do need some alone time. You do need some alone time, however much you do it. At least a little bit every day. You need some alone time to ask yourself and to feel yourself, where is my relationship with Allah? Did I talk to Allah today? Did I did dua to Allah today? Did I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today? Do I have the sweetness, you know there's a sweetness in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do I have the sweetness that when I listen to Allah's command, I, I enjoy listening to Allah's command. I enjoy praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I enjoy listening or am I always just pushing myself? You gotta like sit down and ask yourself, yourself, where am I in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? And if you find that, wait, I'm struggling, I'm really struggling, how will you find this out? Unless you're not spending time with yourself. Right? And in fact, like I said, some of the scholars that were very much influenced with Imam Ghazali and, and, uh, and other uh, thinkers like Imam Ghazali, they used to say, put yourself alone and shut off all your five senses. Shut off all your five senses, so turn off the lights, for example. So you can't see anything, can't hear anything. All your senses are shut off, so that you can actually talk to yourself properly. Because as long as your senses are on, then you're not able to, like, you're being distracted at one way or the other. Right? And in fact, what's interesting is when the companions of the Prophet wasallam, they used to pray in the olden days, there was no lights like this. Mo most of the time, most of the time, if it was Fajr, or if it was Maghrib, or if it was Isha, it was relatively dark in the masjid. They had, you know, there was special arrangements made in the, in the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ, in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, special arrangements made for candles. 
for candles. They made special arrangements. So it's very important that we ask ourselves as parents, we ask ourselves as individuals, and especially the coming generation should ask itself, do every time I want something, I just go for it? Every time I want to play a video game, I say, okay, let me go play a video game. Every time I want to eat something, do I just say yes? Do I ever say no to myself just because my nuff says I want something? Is it necessary that I have to listen to it? Or would you rather put your nafs in control? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The smart one is the one who puts his self in control. And then when your nafs is not in control, then you know what happens to your children when they have to decide between, I'm going to study for an exam today or, play, or party today. Or if I'm going to study for an exam today or play video games today. Then their nafs is saying play video games and that's what they're going to, they're not going to have control over their nafs. And they're going to do and go with their desires. And then, they're, and, and then that will have effect on their lives at the, at the career level, at relationship level, at so many other levels. At the health level. Because they're not able to stop themselves from doing the right thing versus what they desire. And so you have to train your children and yourselves that just because you feel like doing something doesn't mean you have to do it. Just because, kids, just because you feel like I need to play a video game, doesn't mean you need to play a video game. Maybe every day, once a day, you can tell yourself, every once in a while, once a week, once a day, <coughs> you can tell yourself that I'm not going to play video games because I want to be in control of myself. I want to be in control of myself. <coughs> um, time is running out, I want to make this one last point. I have mentioned this many times, but I want to mention it in the context that I'm talking about today. I've, to, I've said that the biggest, the biggest uh, good that we, the, the biggest thing that we have in our lives is the ability to choose. Our life is our choices. Your life is the choices that you make. Listen to what I'm about to say. Your life is the choices you make, but you won't be able to make the right choice if you're always listening to your nuts. Right? You won't be able to make the right choice if you're listening to your nafs. And if you're always training your nafs, oh, your nafs says play video games, you're always playing video games. Your nafs says eat, you're always eating. Your nafs says talk, you're always talking. Then where, where, is, where have you trained yourself? Where have you trained yourself? You haven't trained yourself. You've trained yourself that every time your nafs says, I want something, you do it. And what is the opposite of nafs? The opposite of nafs is aqal. The opposite, your aqal says, do this. Your nafs says do something else. And you're training your nafs. Every time you want to play a video game and you're going to play a video game, and you're never going to say, wait, maybe I should help my mom or listen to my mom or study for my homework. The battle between the aql and the nafs takes place in the heart. The battle between your nafs saying, I want this, and your aql saying, no, do this. The battle place is where? Your heart. Your heart is the battle. Either the nafs takes over the heart, or either the aql takes over the heart. Either your intelligence takes over the heart, or your nafs takes over the heart. And that choice is your. How are you going to train yourself? How are you going to train your kids? Inshallah, I'll end here. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi al-akhirati hasana, wa qina adab al Today, inshallah, um, I have a dafs of Quran at 7.30, and I think there's something for the sisters before that, which you'll hear in your announcements. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم تجعل القرآن ربي قلوبنا والله سبحانه وتعالى help us control our tongues help us to control our intake of food and make our أقل supersede our desires and help us to become masters of ourselves by putting a by being having the ability to put a stop to our nafs ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد 
إن الله يعمركم بالأذن والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم فاستجب لكم فأقيموا الصلاة Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.